Pelvic and acetabular anatomy. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Alicia Scott and I'm Sankib Rahman narrating. We're going to learn the anatomy of the pelvis and acetabulum, go over osteology, ligamentous anatomy, muscular anatomy, neurovascular anatomy, uh, differentiate the palpable landmarks. So let's first start with pelvic ring anatomy. So it's really helpful if you get yourself a um, bone model for this. And um, if you're seriously interested in uh, understanding it, I think uh, that's really essential. So um, there are three bones, uh, the innominate bones uh, on the left and on the right, and then the sacrum that essentially uh, makes up your pelvis. Um, we um, divide things up by saying the ilium, um, which is shown in red, uh, the pubic, uh, pubic bone or pubis, which has a root body and tubercle, and then the ischium. And, um, you know, these are separate bones that uh, fuse uh, during childhood and um, are kind of nicely shown here. So palpable anterior landmarks on a patient with reasonable body habitus include the uh, iliac crest, uh, the anterior superior iliac spine, the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is a little bit harder to palpate, uh, and to some extent, the pubic tubercle. Palpable posterior landmarks, um, which you can uh, examine if the patient's prone, is the posterior iliac crest, the PSIS, and the ischial tuberosity. So as shown from a somewhat uh, medial view or um, intrapelvic view, you can see the uh, iliac crest, the large iliac fossa, um, and then you can see a few other landmarks here. Um, the greater sciatic notch, uh, which is uh, this area here. The lesser sciatic notch, which is right here. Um, and then you can see the sacrum here has been removed. So there's the false and true pelvis. So the false pelvis is essentially you know, when you enter this area here. So you come up and over the iliac crest, you're in that um, iliac fossa, but you're not really down below the pelvic brim here. So once you get below the pelvic brim, that's called the true pelvis, okay? And there are some anatomic structures that uh, sort of help you gain access there, the iliopectinal fascia, namely. Let's talk a little bit more about ligamentous anatomy. So this is what holds the pelvis together. A lot of uh, injuries we're going to talk about in another video involve uh, ligament injuries in the pelvis. For instance, uh, when you have um, APC patterns, uh, we'll talk about later, uh, those involve a lot of uh, ligament disruptions, essentially. And sometimes you don't have a fracture, but you have an unstable pelvis. So anteriorly, you have the pubic um, symphysis. Uh, you have the inguinal ligament. Um, posteriorly, you have the anterior SI ligaments. Uh, you then have the iliolumbar ligament. And sometimes with certain unstable pelvic fractures, you'll see an avulsion of the L5 transverse process fracture right here as a result of an avulsion of the iliolumbar ligament. Uh, and then posteriorly, uh, you have the posterior SI ligaments. These are the strongest ligaments here. And when they're disrupted, typically, that means you now have rotational and vertical instability. Now, let's not forget about the pelvic floor. These include the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments. And those are disrupted in uh, many injury patterns as well. So looking a little closer at the anterior ligaments, you have the uh, symphysis pubis, which is a fibrocartilage, superior pubic ligament, uh, and then the inferior pubic ligament, uh, and then you have the inguinal ligament, and that's sort of your anterior structures. This is a view from posterior now, similar view to what we saw before. Uh, here you can see the, um, uh, the posterior interosseous, uh, or the posterior um, uh, sacroiliac uh, ligaments. So um, that is made up of the um, uh, posterior uh, sacroiliac ligaments, interosseous uh, sacroiliac ligaments, the iliolumbar ligament we showed previously, uh, anteriorly, 
Here you can also start to see the um, the uh, pelvic floor, sacro tuberous uh, and sacrospinous ligaments uh, shown in um, this image from posteriorly. So what do the ligaments do? Well, uh, the anterior SI ligaments help to resist external rotation and they will often fail first with external rotation patterns. Posterior SI ligaments um, resist um, vertical translation. So when you have a vertical and rotationally unstable pelvic fracture, typically the posterior SI ligaments or equivalent, like a vertical sacral fracture have occurred. Uh, the dorsal uh, sacroiliac ligaments resist AP translation. The iliolumbar ligament helps to resist rotation. Uh, the sacrospinous ligament also resists external rotation. The sacrotuberous ligament resists cranial caudal translation and flexion. It's a little bit about the muscular anatomy. So this kind of shows the uh, origins of the um, muscle on the pelvis viewed from the uh, outer table on the left and the inner table on the right. So you can see the uh, ilium it serves as an origin for the uh, abductor muscles, the gluteus medius and minimus, um, as well as partially the gluteus maximus. Uh, you also have the um, uh, insertions of the um, uh, uh, quadratus femoris, uh, the obturator externus, obturator internus, uh, and then on the um, inner table side you can see the origin of the iliacus muscle, uh, which helps to join the psoas muscle to form the iliopsoas. Um, so that's the main muscle you're going to encounter. Uh, when you get into the true pelvis below the um, pelvic brim here, um, the main muscle covering the um, quadrilateral plate is your obturator internus muscle after it passes through the uh, lesser sciatic notch. A little bit about neurovascular pelvic anatomy. So um, the lumbosacral uh, plexus forms most of the neural anatomy here as shown here. So you have multiple nerves passing through here, the ilioinguinal nerve, genitofemoral nerve, uh, of course, the lateral femoral, femoral cutaneous nerve. Um, and then uh, there are multiple nerve roots. You can see the L5 nerve root kind of right here over the anterior aspect of the uh, S1 um, uh, sacral ala. Um, the obturator nerve, another important nerve that traverses um, through the true pelvis and then out the obturator ring. So a little bit of a closer uh, look, you can see the L4 and L5 nerve roots uh, coursing over the anterior sacrum. Uh, this is important, especially the L5 nerve root uh, when you think about uh, iliosacral screw placement, for example. Obturator nerve, um, very important when you're doing anterior intrapelvic approaches or modified stopa approaches. That nerve will be very much in your field and needs to be protected. As I mentioned already, the L5 nerve root is at risk. Um, it sits here as shown in these as these blue dots on the anterior sacral ala of S1, coursing from proximal to distal. And uh, if you breach the uh, so if you place a screw, for example, and you sort of breach the cortex anteriorly, you could potentially damage the L5 nerve root and get a foot drop. A little bit about the vascular anatomy. Well, this involves the common iliac system with the external iliac then coming um, distally and eventually forming the um, superficial uh, femoral artery. Uh, and then the internal iliac artery, which uh, courses medial um, to the vein and splits into the anterior and posterior branches. Um, multiple branches, you'll have the superior gluteal artery passing through the greater sciatic notch. Um, obturator artery. So multiple vessels here. Um, when you have pelvic fractures, oftentimes there are branches of the internal iliac uh, that are injured. You also have the sacral venous plexus. Um, so a lot of times we can't really readily identify this. Um, for instance, on arteriogram, patient has bleeding in the, with a pelvic fracture, they get an arteriogram. Maybe you identify uh, an internal iliac artery branch that's uh, injured, but
But in fact, the majority of the hemorrhage is probably coming from sacral venous plexus injury. So how do we treat that? Well, that's why we talk about closing down the space tamponade by uh, reducing the physical volume of the pelvis with sheets and binders and external fixation. So the internal iliac system, this is shown uh, in a slightly different view, um, has uh, anterior division, posterior division. Um, there are the obturator artery we talked about before, the superior gluteal artery, inferior gluteal artery, iliac lumbar artery. So that's quite a uh, rich um, uh, system. And um, here you can see this is coming from you know, proximal to distal. Here is your internal iliac and various branches. Here's your external iliac, which I mentioned before, exits and forms the uh, femoral artery. So it's important to understand uh, a little bit of the um, vascular anatomy in the retropubic area. So this is um, a view from inside the pelvis. So uh, this is the, um, uh, if you're viewing from inside the um, pubic symphysis, for example. So imagine this is the superior pubic ramus and you're viewing it from inside the pelvis. So uh, it's very common to have small caliber anastomosis between the obturator and external iliac slash inferior epigastric systems, about 70%. When you get a very large uh, vessel here, um, they can be called the so-called corona mortis or the crown of death. And uh, essentially, um, this is an area where sometimes you're working if you're doing acetabular fixation or possibly if you're doing anterior um, pelvis uh, fracture fixation or pubic symphysis plating. And um, you have to be very cautious as you are elevating tissues off of the uh, superior pubic ramus that you don't encounter a very large vessel here or any vessel here that needs to be dealt with. So that's that anastomosis that and it comes up on exams quite a bit. So let's pause here and we'll pick up on acetabular anatomy in the second and last part of this video.